This is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. Our show today helps create the connection between what it is that we need to do in education and why political reform is so important. We have two guests here that have literally donated millions of dollars through their private foundations into education, truly trying to reform the system to make certain that every child has the right to an equal education and also to help provide for greater choices amongst parents. These two individuals, Sarah Smallhouse as well as Don Buttinger, Sarah runs the Brown Foundation, Don Buttinger uh, has the Rodell Foundation. They've invested incredible amounts of time and effort, not only into education, but into the reform efforts. You're gonna hear about the connection between those today and why it is that this reform effort is so important if we're going to give your kids the education that they need and the educational system that this country must have if we're gonna be successful. Thanks for joining us again. This is Paul Johnson, and now on with our two guests. Don and Sarah, I'd like to welcome both of you to the Optimistic American today. Thanks for being on our show. Thank you for having us. All right. It's a pleasure. All right. So here's my uh, my first question. Uh, both of you have, in your own right, been important leaders in, in our community and in the community. Uh, you also both are deeply involved in foundations. And I, I want to start by talking about your foundations and your philanthropic giving, because it, it really is outstanding. So, Sarah, I'm going to start with you on this question. Uh, I've been involved with uh, the Brown Foundation, especially Flynn Brown, that has been very active in trying to help develop leadership in Arizona. Uh, I know that we're going to talk about reform efforts that are going on in our political process. But before we do that, it, it seems to me that you've made leadership a high priority in Arizona. And I'd like to know why that is. We have made leadership a high priority. And um, we were fortunate to have Jack Jewett as one of our trustees for many years. He was um, just a supreme statesman. He at one point was uh, president of the Senate in Arizona. He was a publisher. He himself ran a foundation. He was uh, a huge uh, influence on our board and where we felt we could make the most impact. The Brown Foundation's focus almost exclusively on education. We are the legacy of a technology company, and we focus in particular on STEM education and economic education. But the further we got into our, our grant making work, the more we felt um, and it wasn't just a feeling, it, it was an analysis, it was actual, that our dollars were kind of replacing public dollars because the public investment wasn't there anymore. It just kept getting less and less. And you know, at some point it dawns on you that it doesn't really matter how big a foundation you have, you you cannot fund a public education system. So we started advocating for better uh, education, more resources, more investment, um, more equity in our, mostly our K-12 system and the universities. Uh, the University of Arizona in particular has been a big beneficiary of our grants. and. What we encountered was that um, it was like talking to a wall. It really didn't get very far on that strategy. And it, it got more and more frustrating. And so then a group of foundations um, organized by the Arizona Grant Makers, which is a kind of like an association of foundations, um, we went down to lobby at the Capitol and talk about how policymakers and philanthropists could work together. And, you know, it just, it just wasn't producing results. So then we thought, well, we should invest in civic leadership. We'll partner with the Flynn Foundation, which is a, an amazing foundation in Arizona. And we'll put, 
will put people who are uh, recommended by their peers through uh, basically an eight week seminar series and teach them about all the different areas of policy making in Arizona and, and how the budget is negotiated and how uh, Jack used to call it the secret sauce, how, how uh, people from different perspectives can come together and come up with practical solutions that serve all Arizonans. We, we wanted to support that. And so we have, and we now have over 400 people who are widely recognized by uh, those whom they work with and are in influential positions. But what we had discovered was that um, if they wanted to run for the legislature, they're basically unelectable because they're not pure to one political philosophy or another. And so here we have a fa two foundations who have invested, and I'm not going to say it wasn't, it hasn't had impact. It has had impact, but not the impact we originally thought we would have. We thought we were training people for enlightened service in the legislature and senior staff people for, for our elected officials. And, you know, it's been, um, it's been discouraging. I, I, I think my sister, who is an equal partner in our foundation, um, we both believe that education is really the bedrock of pretty much anything else whether it's good health or innovation or in, enlightened public policy, whatever it is, technology, you need education. And in Arizona, I'm, I'm not going to belabor it, but, you know, we have a lot of work to do in Arizona to, to really give our kids um, it, an equal chance in a very competitive world. And so now I forgot what the question was you asked me. But That's okay. I think the, you know, the, I, I, I'm going to come back to it because on the leadership side, uh, the Flynn Brown Foundation has sent me a number of your graduates, Republicans, Democrats, people who weren't registered in either party, to try to help them think about what a campaign would look like. And uh, I, I found some interesting results from that. But I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to jump over to Don if I can. Don, your group, uh, the Rodell Foundation has put a lot of money into education as well. And I know that you've been kind of an outward spokesperson for reform in education. I'd love to hear, why did you guys start the foundation? What was the purpose and what's your experience been on the educational front? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I, I think Sarah teed up the purpose of all this beautifully. Um, when we were building the Rodell Company, one of the things we noticed toward the latter part of our effort was the education difference between the high school graduates we hired in Europe and in Asia to run our factories and in the United States. And once I realized that and saw the data of that to understand the how real that was and how uh, concerning that was, we decided when we sold the company, we took uh, about $200 million from the sale of the company and created three foundations, two public foundations, one in Delaware and one in Arizona, totally committed to leading an investment effort to improve the public education system in those two states as a exemplar for what the whole country might do. So that's the reason we got into the education piece. And Sarah's exactly right about the leadership. The, if you look at the history of, of, of countries going back a couple thousand years, the leading countries in the world at the time that they were the leader had the best public education systems in the world. And it's true of the United States. That is now at risk. And we have succeeded in Delaware big time. We won the uh, Obama administration race to the top as the, as the top performing, improving public education system in the United States. In Arizona, we do not have a commitment to the system, to the quality of the system and everybody in it. We had two programs at Rodell that are an example of this. We, had, we took the top 20 teachers every year through a rigorous process awarded them, thanked them, gave them a $10,000 bonus if they would teach in a poverty district. We assigned six student teachers from the three universities to learn from these great teachers. The other thing we did, we had a program called MACRO. One of the 
things that's true about the learning process is learning math at third grade cascades into all the other learning uh, disciplines. So it's the place to go if you want to improve the whole system and help every kid. We could not sell these programs to our legislature. They didn't care. I have the privilege of being on the basis charter school board. Craig Barrett and I chair that. We have the number one performing charter school system in the United States. We have extreme difficulty to even get our legislators to come down and see why it works. What do we pay our teachers? How big is the classroom size? Higher standards, rigorous curriculum, parent involvement, adequate funding, help for struggling students. The what needs to be done is very well known. What's missing in Arizona is the commitment by our leaders to do what it takes for the whole system to improve rather than just concentrate on the parent and try to give a few parents what they may think that they want just for themselves and their kids. Yeah, I think. And, I, and I think go ahead, Sarah. You hit on a really important point, Don, which is systems level change. You know, I think what I was getting at in my long winded answer to your first question was that we're not getting anywhere by funding a program or, you know, even giving, I mean, scholarships are incredibly important to those who receive them, but you can't give every single person a scholarship who's in financial distress. So what Don's, you know, alluding to is our entire education system and philanthropy can be really helpful in d doing what you did in Delaware, showing proof of concept, showing where you can go and what works. But what philanthropy cannot do is replace the public sector funding of public education. And um, we need, I, I'm, I'm a great beneficiary of education. And one of my teachers once uh, gave me a model that sticks in my head. You have the private sector, you have the public sector, and then you have the third sector, which is like NGOs and nonprofits and educational institutions. And where all of those intersect, if you can get sustained investment, you have progress. But what we have right now is a strained um, arrangement where the public sector is just not, frankly, playing its role in the overall system. And I, um, I think that we owe it to next generations. I think we have really big challenges right now that needs serious analysis and serious brain power on how to solve them. And we don't really have time to be fiddling around with what is amounts to pure politics. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And there's too much of that going on. So the idea is if we want to improve our education system, we need to also improve our systems and our leadership. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, Don, I just want to give you, take my hats off to you and, uh, and uh, take a point of personal privilege here. Um, the basis program, I have four grandchildren in the basis program today. Um, and for some of them, it's been a little too hard and they've had to move on to other things, but it is exceptional. And you can just tell when you talk to these kids, I mean, I'm talking about third, fourth, fifth graders. They're, I, I can't even imagine being taught the things that they're being taught in basis at that young age. And it's, it, it's interesting because it's free. There's no cost to anyone. And so the question becomes, if you have kids who are going to perform at that level, should middle class or lower class parents have a chance to participate in a completely privatized system they wouldn't have the chance to participate in the system that yeah, you put fact, together um, everyone gets it for free but i just wanted to thank you for that i, I think it's important you know thank you, you know, basis was initially launched to challenge our uh, best kids our brightest kids because our top 10 percent in america has fallen behind the top 10 percent in at least six other countries 
Craig Barrett and I led a effort about six years ago to experiment and open a basic school in the poverty part of Phoenix, 19th Avenue and Southern. And I'll tell you, we learned a lot. First thing we learned is it's harder. It takes more time. It takes more money. It takes more work. But every kid from a broken home in a poverty environment can learn just as well as any kid in the top socioeconomic area. What we are frustrated by is that we can't get our elected leaders to understand that if you're committed to every kid to improve the system, you have to be willing to invest more for those who need it instead of what we call uh, re rewarding the best. I mean, that's very nice, but it's not a business like let's let's give more money to the top performing uh, group in the business. Teaching kids from poverty costs more. If you don't have a 5,000 word vocabulary when you enter kindergarten, you have dramatically lower expectations and likelihood of success. Picture this, we opened Basis South Phoenix and the cutest little girl comes up to us starting kindergarten. She has a pencil in her hand and she says to us, what's this? The first time in her life she saw a pencil. Can you imagine the family that she comes from? The educational quality of, of conversation, if you will. And yet a year later, that kid was number one in her class. She so figured what, out what the pencil was for. <laughs> figured it out. But the, po the point is, we should be committed to every kid. And yeah. It shouldn't just be about some or who can do the best or re rewarding the, the, the schools that have the top performance. And we just, we don't elect people. And I know this is the second part of your, your discussion with Sarah and me. We, we don't elect people who are committed to the whole system. All right. So let me, uh, let me go back to Sarah for a moment. Cause I want to, uh, you were making a point a moment ago and I just want to uh, see if you agree with this. Uh, this has been my experience. In the political system today, we have these two parties. One party um, tends to be very willing to give more money, but they want no reforms. They're not really willing to take on the hard issues where reforms work. We have another party that would pass almost any reform you could imagine, but they not only don't want to give it more money, oftentimes they're trying to figure out how to take money away from it. My experience is the two existing parties, neither one of them oftentimes because of their other, the other interest groups that they're involved with are really promoting what we need in education. But I'd love your input on that. You can disagree with it if you disagree. Well, my, my background is in economics and I tend to think in terms of um, incentive systems and you know, my belief is, and I think there's a lot of evidence to back it up, that we don't reward policymakers who make systemic long-term decisions. The, the policymakers are under extreme pressure all the time to toe the line. And, and they're getting a lot of those instructions, quite frankly, from out of Arizona. And it's, it's a weird, I mean, I don't feel that old, but you know, the whole news environment is so different now. It's, you know, what is it? If it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. there, there's so much pressure for sensationalistic headlines that um, people in the public sector, are, they're just playing to a different crowd. And because of the way our system is organized, into a primary election and a general election. And especially with the primaries being further subdivided into partisan primaries and combine that with people feeling a little apathetic and not showing up for those primaries. And what you get is a very small percentage of people who are making the decisions about who represents all of us and no big surprise. Guess what? They don't represent all of us. They represent the people who elected them. And I, you know, I think I think this is an Achilles heel. However, fortunately, optimistically, we live in America. 
we have things that we can do. In America, the citizens are responsible. There is no government that we don't put in place. So we can make it better. And Absolutely. I think that's what I'm all about right now. Don? Uh, gosh, how can I add to that? I, t I totally agree. Um, we, we need to have a system that rewards people who can identify what needs to be done, who have the vision to articulate it, the ability to get it done, um, instead of winning elections by trashing your opponent. L look at the caliber of discussion of our last two elections. Pick a, pick a, pick a presidential discussion, pick a gubernatorial discussion, pick a senatorial discussion, the House or the, st uh, the state House or Senate. It's rarely about what matters most to most Americans and most Arizonans. And education is the key and the leadership of the process is the key. I think what Sarah is speaking to is exactly right. It's our responsibility as citizens to stand up and take control of the key institutions in our state and elect the people to those leadership positions who can do the job that needs to be done. And right. it's a hard job. It's a, it's really, a hard. really hard job. So, you know, I, I think I, th that's why we invest in the Flynn Brown program. It's not, n nobody's, tr you know, there, you often hear people say, well, nobody teaches you how to be a parent. Well, guess what? Nobody really teaches you how to be a legislator either. I mean, there are a lot of lawyers in the legislature, <laughs> but you know, it's a hard job and there's nothing really in my imagination that it doesn't involve some trade-offs. You know, we can have lofty goals, but sometimes they're conflicting. And and there is the rub. You've, you've got to work out the way we can all come together and thrive over time. And um, it's become very tribal. And yeah. I don't think that's good for our community or our state. One of the greatest divisions that exists in our society today is, there's no doubt about it, it's the, uh, uh, the income inequality. There's lots of conversation about that. But when you talk about that issue, that really comes down to 60% of America doesn't have a college degree. Those with the college degree definitely end up having a better life. They, they actually live longer, right? M much less do they get better jobs and better opportunities. So if you want to fix the problems, and that doesn't matter whether it's the problem where we're talking about underprivileged minorities or underprivileged white people who live in, in a variety of places throughout our country. It's going to be through education that we're going to fix that. Now, here's what, uh, what I wanted to point out, because I think the next section of this, I'd like to talk about the problems with the existing system, and then we'll come to the solutions. So the problem with the existing system, Sarah and your group, they would send me 10 or 15 people, I don't know who would do it. I knew Jack pretty well, maybe he was sending them over to me, but 10 or 15 people, every class would come over and they would wanna go through, how do you run for office? Some of these people were the brightest people that you had ever met. Very, very sharp, very smart. They, they cared about the issues, about the details of issues, about how things worked. And again, they were Republicans, Democrats, independents, but, but they could come together on how to fix different policy issues, things that they saw as being important. So in part of the training, what I would do is I'd show them polling and I'd say, okay, I wanna give you the numbers first, right? Here are the numbers. If you take a look at all the voters that exist, only about 75% of them are registered, right? The, the potential voter. Then of the 75% that are registered in Arizona today, non-affiliated voters make up about a third. In the country, it's 44%, but in Arizona, it's about a third. In fact, they're the largest group. That means that only a third are Democrat, a third are Republicans. In the turnout in the primary, you only end up having about 30% of them turn out. So don't go poll what everybody thinks. Don't even go poll what every person who's vote or who's registered to vote things. Don't even poll people who are going to vote in the next general election. 85% of the seats are gerrymandered. And when you get done with the gerrymandering, 
the, the person in that safe seat that wins or wins that primary, they're going to win the general. In fact, they're probably not going to even have an opponent. So go poll the 5% of the people who vote in those primaries, 5 to 8%. And that's the real number when you get down to it, the 5 to 8%. And look at what they think. And then we'd give them what they think. We'd give them what we're seeing in polling. It was I figured out when I was done, I was the worst guy to be mentoring them because they'd get done looking at this going, I'm not doing that. I'm just, first, those aren't even the issues that I care about. And second, those issues are the positions that they want you to take are so extreme. I'm, I'm not really interested. They were all, all the issues are, are the cultural divides that exist. But Basically, if you want to talk about this, education. This system puts candidates in an ethical conundrum. If they want to be successful, they have to talk to a narrow slice who they may not really agree with. But if they say what they really think and listen to a broader audience, which, by the way, I think would characterize most of the Flynn Brown fellows, then you're probably not going to be successful in that primary because those 8% of the people are tend to be the most ideologically driven and pure, if you will. On both sides. And mm -hmm. if you don't fit into that slot, then you're not trustworthy in their minds. And um, I think this is a systemic flaw we need to fix. It's not producing the results we deserve. It's not producing good long-term policy and and we do need we we have urgent problems and long-term problems we, i mean we need we need really bright people with who are incented to do the right things in our state legislature and i i don't think anybody runs for office because they're you know got you know bad thoughts or you know want to manipulate the system for their own benefit I think they all really are trying to go improve society. But the fact of the matter is none of us know everything. We have to talk to each other. We have to work it out. And we don't create that environment for our legislators. I, I've heard many people say, and maybe it's an exaggeration, but the majority just doesn't pay any attention to the minority because they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And they're so far apart. So, Don, how do you feel about all of that? Yeah, I think Sarah, again, summarized it very, very nicely. Here's the problem. In Arizona, because we have a semi-closed primary system funded by all taxpayers, but run by the two parties, with the greatest majority of registered voters unable to vote, unless they go back and join the party they don't belong to, you get the extremes of both parties winning their primaries. And then because of the way the redistricting works, they go to the general election and 95% of them win the general election. Look at a couple of examples of well-respected, conservative, thoughtful, smart Republicans. Look at uh, Rusty Bowers. Look at Jeff Flake on the Republican side. Look at Kirsten Sinema on the Democratic side. These people have won their general elections overwhelmingly their whole careers. They can't currently win their own primaries. That's not okay. To win the primary, you've got to appeal to the hardcore base. You don't even have to cooperate with the other side. Matter of fact, if you cooperate with the other side, it's a negative. Compromise, which used to be the nugget of progress for most of our history, is now perceived as a weakness. Yeah. Do not negotiate with the other side. You do not accept any of their ideas. And if you look at the history of the country, if you look at the, the, the time between the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and when the Constitution 11 years later was created, that was 11 years of debate and argument and fighting between the rights of the federal government and the rights of the states. And Virginia was on the states that wanted equal treatment and New Jersey was on the side of the population, wanted the population to be the determinant. And at one point, both sides were willing 
to take the best idea of their opponent and include it and incorporate it. So compromise wasn't the purpose of their work. It was the result of their work. But we don't do that now. So we're not even willing to learn from what made us great. And I think it's a huge problem in what we're trying to do. And Sarah and myself and you and many others is we're trying to open the primaries, trying to make them available to everybody where every vote counts equally. Every vote is verified. Everybody running for office has the same number of signatures required to get on the ballot. Why is it okay to have the largest number of our voting citizens required to get six times as many signatures to get on the ballot? And yeah, not and that, one single person in our legislature is an independent. That is not okay. That, that is the you know the point to when you look at those primaries. What you would hope is, and by the way, everyone in your group would come to it. Well, maybe I don't run as a Republican or Democrat. Maybe I run as an independent. Well, when you explain to them, you know, signatures today cost about ten bucks a signature. If you run as a Democrat, you need six thousand signatures. If you run as a Republican for governor or Secretary of State, you need about six thousand signatures. If you run as an independent, you need about 50,000 signatures. Right. That was done intentionally. It was done intentionally to make it very hard for them. If you, do, if you are successful, your name is always last on the ballot. You can't get the voter rolls. The people that you have to communicate with, if you're in the Democratic Party, you get it for free. If you're in the Republican Party, you get it for free. But if you're an independent, you can't even get the voter rolls to know who's registered and not registered without paying an incredibly high amount of money for it. The point is this. They've intentionally created a system to box out those independents. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, they, they want to keep this a duopoly. They want to keep this as a, they don't want other choices to be allowed. They want you to have to choose between the two. And they're convinced that as bad as their side is, and they know their side's bad, that you'll think the other side's worse. And if you think the other side's worse, they can win. But where, where we lose on it, you were just talking about, it. it's not just the abortion issue where you could be pro-choice or pro-life. It's on easier or complex issues like education, but where it would be easier to come up with a compromise. However, if you cross the aisle and go find a compromise with people on the other side, they see you as working with the enemy and they'll primary you. They'll try to beat you. They want to ensure that that caucus, that you have to have a majority of the caucus to get anything done, meaning the party is being put way before country, way before the state, way before the interest of, of average people. That's why it needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. you, you've summarized it beautifully. All right. Well, and, and I would um, tack on to that, that our founding fathers um, were thoughtful and they made our elections a matter of state determination. Every state gets to choose how they're going to elect their representatives. And so in Arizona, there's nobody, there's nobody that's going to ride in on a white horse with white hat, although Don comes really close. He does come, he does come close. <laughs> but we have to do this. We have, we have to do this. And it's, um, it's not something, uh, honestly, I think that, you know, a lot of that's, that's the subject of a lot of dinner conversation for the households that even sit around and have dinner conver conversation anymore. So there's a big educational uh, requirement here. I think that foundations and other organizations need to step up to, to kind of raise awareness over what this so-called primary problem is. It, you know, it, it had to be explained to me a couple times before the, the math clicked. But then you go back to what Don was saying earlier. You know, some of these kids, they're, they're left behind in math by third grade. Well, right. as a society, we need to all work together and be respectful of one another and recognize that there are competing goals we need to work out in an environment of constrained resources. So let's talk and for a moment. It's not easy. Let's talk for a moment about the reforms. Um, and, and let's break this into two parts because I think it's important too. Um, there's the primary. So let's talk 
about the primary first. And then after we're done talking about the primary, we'll talk about the general election. But just a quick sum, a summary. In today's primary, everybody runs in a party. Independents are basically discriminated against. And the top vote getter from both of those parties move forward to the general election. And then in the general election, you get to choose between the lesser of two evils. Let's start with the primary. And if you could talk about how what kind of reforms could happen in the primary system that might be advantageous to us? Well, you, you open it up to everybody can run. And some number of the top vote getters move on to the final election. But it's not just the extreme of the two parties who are the only two people you get to vote for at the general election. So you take you take a closed system dominated by the two extremes. You open it up to everybody. And it, it totally changes the whole process changes the quality of the public policy debate. It changes the it does not reward attacking your opponent. It rewards talking about the issues and offering solutions. And it's it, it even polls close to 80 percent. Sarah and almost nothing. nothing yeah, I think that the principle here is to treat all voters equally and to give all voters an opportunity to vote for who they want to. Like now, I mean, because we have semi-closed primaries, if you are not registered to one of the parties, you might have to request a ballot. And you can only request one ballot. You can get one from the Democrats or you can get one from the Republicans. But you can't, but what about if I like Susie Smith, who's a Republican, and I also like, you know, Joe Brown, who's a Republican, but, but I can't vote for them. But they're I running in different races. Yeah. One or the other ballot. And so it's just really a way of um, c constraining choices that is not helpful, frankly, to anyone except for the political parties. So if we were to reform just the primary, we would start by saying, hey, uh, every candidate, regardless of what party they're in, has a right to vote. They have to collect the same amount of signatures. You can't discriminate against one versus the other. You can't move them around on the ballot so that it gives an advantage to one party over the other. Right. Um, all candidates run against one another. And the top vote getters, whether that's two, three, four, or five, whatever the number is, different states are doing that differently. But you reform it so that you make certain that it's fair, not only to all uh, people running for office, but to all voters. So that when a voter has a chance to vote, the, uh, the, you know we're all paying for the system equally, but independents aren't really getting the use out of it as a voter, that everyone, every voter and every candidate is treated the same. Well, and I happen to know a, a very excellent politician who has run in both forms, semi-closed and open. And one of the things he told me was that when you run in an open primary, you get your voter list and you go knock on every single door and you listen to every single person and you make an effort to appreciate every single perspective. And then you try to work it out and represent everybody. And yet, when you go into a partisan system, it's like the math you laid out earlier in this program. You have to narrow it down to who does it matter. And who, you know, what matters is that sliver of primary voters, and that's who you have to target if you want to be successful. It, it's a stark difference between an open primary and a closed or semi-closed primary. All right. Stark difference. Um, and I don't want to be uh, presumptuous, but I think that was me that you were talking about. So thank you. Um, yes. And I did. I've, I've run in both <laughs> systems. I've seen the advantage of an open primary and I've seen the disadvantages of a closed primary. The, the closed primary stifled ideas. You, you couldn't have ideas. Mm -hmm. You needed to have an orthodoxy. When you ran in a open primary, you could talk to everyone and then you could say, hmm, here's a creative solution to that problem that's that I now see that there are different points of views here. And and your goal was figuring out how to pull people together. All right, now let's go to the runoff. So in the runoff, 
uh, if you would, try to explain um, the difference between top two, top three, top four, top five, uh, instant runoff, ranked choice voting, how you see those uh, playing out or being beneficial. Shall I? Sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Open primaries would be a really great reform. You know, people are used to having two candidates on the ballot. And there's a lot of people think that for that reason, you know, having the top two from an open primary go to the general election would be kind of a natural, easy thing. But the problem is that too often you can get two Democrats or two Republicans. The chances of getting anybody besides a Republican or a Democrat is slim. And so it doesn't really create the, um, you know, the opportunity for our ideas to surface. If you had the top three, that would be better. Maybe you would get an independent or an affiliated person. Um, but then you have to choose how are you going to pick the winner? If you have three candidates and you just say whoever gets the most votes wins, you'd be back into the situation where a minority of voters could easily seat somebody. And so instead, an alternative is what's known as ranked choice voting with instant runoff. And that is not complicated. Everybody goes to the polls and instead of voting for just one person, you get to vote for all the candidates on the ballot in order. This is my first choice. This is my second choice. This is my third choice. And when the tally is done, if somebody gets 50% or more of the first place votes, they win. If it's divided up in a way that nobody has a majority, then what they do in an instant runoff system is they eliminate the candidate that had the least amount of first place votes and take their second choice votes and make them count. And in a top three situation, then somebody will have to have a majority of the vote to win. But they had to reach a little broader swath of the electorate to get that support. Same thing with top four, except with top four, you expand it to a little bit more idea, more competition in ideas. And um, if you go to top five, which many people would say is the gold standard, you're almost sure to capture a diverse body of candidates that the entire electorate can choose from. And with the instant runoff process with, and ranked choice voting, you are guaranteed that even if maybe you don't get your first choice, the chances of you're getting a candidate that you can live with are very good. You, you eliminate what's known as the spoiler effect, where you don't vote for the person you really want because you're scared if you do that, then your second choice will lose to your least favorite candidate. And with ranked choice voting, you don't have that. Another thing you don't have is all the negative campaigning because the candidates realize, hey, look, if I'm not gonna be your first choice, I'd like to be your second choice. So John and Susie have similar views in this arena. And I, you know, I prefer one over the other, but if I don't get my first choice, I'll be okay with my second choice. And in our system right now, it's winner take all, that's it. And in districts, as you have pointed out, where even though we have an independent redistricting commission, communities of interest want to be kept together. And we, we just do have districts that lean heavily Democrat or heavily Republican. And in that situation, that's the kind of solutions you're going to get unless you go to something like a ranked choice voting system. All right, Don. So Don. you could you could definitely uh, you could definitely comment on that if you'd like, Don. But really, what I'd like you to focus on, if you could, uh, the reform effort. I know there's some talk about creating one initiative that puts them both on the ballot. There's also discussion about separating them. 
Could you give me maybe your thoughts on that? Well, well I think the primaries is the core reform. Go, go ahead, Don. You answer this. <laughs> I think Sarah did a beautiful job of summarizing the solution part of this issue. Those of us who have worked in this space for a long time have been concerned about it and want to fix it and have done the work to understand all these alternatives, have done studies of other states and what they've done and how they did it. It makes a lot of sense to us. Most of our fellow citizens have not done that work. I worry about as we get into top five and ranked choice voting that we're going to lose people. It just sounds complicated or people who have chosen to believe the lie that our voting machines have compromised or connected to the internet or Hugo Chavez can come out of Venezuela and <laughs> change the outcome and all that stuff. Get nervous when they hear about going, dropping the fifth and going to fourth and third, like, like I've lost control of that, even though they voted in their own sequence. On the other hand, if you look at Alaska, this is, I think this is the upside benefit of, RCB. Sarah Palin was not popular in Alaska. But if you're a Republican in Alaska, you feel compelled to vote for whoever is the candidate, and they voted for her first. They voted for her opponent second. The independents did not vote for her first, or second, or maybe third. And the Democrats didn't vote for her for sure first or second or third. The result is that the independents and some Democrats contributed to the outcome in a much more even way, and she lost to a Democrat. And yet that very same process with the very same voters produced a Republican governor. So it kind of confirms the point that Sarah made. That's a wonderful outcome. In answer to your question, I'm concerned that we might need to have to do this in two steps. I don't know that we can ask our citizens to take the whole solution in one bite. It might be too much, but I think the safest thing to do is to get open primaries established first. And you know, I would add to the Alaska example that the Alaska legislature works together across the aisle better than any other state. Yep. Yeah, we had Kathy on the show, I guess I should say, uh, Senator Gessel, we had her on uh, this show talking about she's the majority leader. Um, and her point was in almost every seat, there was a Republican that won a Republican seat, a Democrat that won a Democratic seat. She said, but their willingness not only to work with one another, but their actual desire to work with one another has gone through the roof, that they've been able to come up with bipartisan solutions. They even created a caucus that had Democrats and Republicans inside of it. Her point was is that she's never seen a more cooperative legislature. She also said they're focused on very different issues. She said our priorities, she said they haven't always been this way, but she said our priorities are economic development, infrastructure, and schools, education. <laughs> oh, Which, man. It's amazing to think that that's, that's not the norm, but her point was no, the norm under a partisan system are issues that are very divisive. So we have, there is, you know, reform is starting to happen. You know, Oregon and Washington instituted open primaries. I mean, uh, California and Washington, Oregon is getting ready to consider initiative on their election system. Nevada has already voted to reform their election system. Colorado's looking at it. Um, a lot of cities around the country use ranked choice voting. It's not really a mysterious process. So there is like, there is a bit of a mood of the moment that um, I think has captured people's imaginations about how do we catch up? I mean, those statistics that Don kind of rattled off at the beginning of this program are of deep concern. I mean, we must educate our next generation and our infrastructure. I mean, I, I watched a program last night on uh, some adventurer in Switzerland. Oh my gosh, you look at their infrastructure and you could start to drool. And <laughs> we, you know, we can do this. 
But we can't do it if we're fighting, infighting all the time, in disarray, and wasting our resources, which is my observation. That's what we're doing now. And we're not rich enough to do that. We have to apply ourselves. All right. So I'd like to thank both of you. I, I want to thank both of you for a few things. First, I love the work that you all have done on education and leadership in the state for a uh, a very long time. That's not meant to be an insult to anybody here amongst the three of us, but you've been working on those issues for a very long time. Uh, I'm excited to see what we're able to come up with in the reform effort, whether it ends up combining uh, the ranked choice voting or the top two along with the open primary, or whether or not we send forward the open primary and allow the other portion to be decided by the legislature. It probably is going to date this uh, this video, because by the time this video comes out, that decision will probably be made. But you have put your your time, your effort, your money, even your reputations on all those issues. So I'd just like to thank both of you for all that you've done. Well, well thank right you. back at you, Paul. I mean, what you're doing with this program is fantastic because it's all about, you know, awareness and spreading the word and letting more people think about this. Because honestly, in my personal experience, these reforms, once people kind of get the information and they have a little bit of time to digest it, they're on board. It's just a slight, it's just a little bit esoteric. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't the, the stuff of, I don't know, sports. <laughs> So anyway, it's, um, it's a pleasure to talk about it. I really think getting our foundational institutions, especially right now, our election system, in line with what people want it to, pr you know, to produce for us, you know, be better solutions and better choices for us at the ballot and better results. We really need to work on that. We're, we're not living up to our potential and it's not necessary, but there is something to do. So it is an optimistic thing. Yes. And D thank you for having us. So Don, we're gonna give you the last word in today's show. Uh, if you would, tell us what you think. The key to the progress of any state is the quality of its public education system. There is a ton of data that supports the better the educational quality, the higher the standard of living of its citizens. So our number one objective must be to improve Arizona's public education system. And that starts by having the right leadership to guide us through the process. Gosh, I love that. Again, both of you, beautiful people. Thank you so much for being on the show and uh, hopefully we'll get a lot more done over the upcoming year on this issue. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. It's a privilege. Thanks. Thanks for joining the Optimistic American Show. Now help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned. We can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.